Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University, and welcome to Outrider 2, How to Write a Research Proposal. Yay! And this particular Outrider comes by request from Fiona Queen Fee. Queen Fee, you are the best in the universe. So this is a really important topic, and I know it creates all this worry and fear and confusion, you know, what is a research proposal and what goes in it and what doesn't go in it and oh my goodness me, how long is it? All these questions. Now, all those questions will be answered in the Outrider this week, but can I say, remember we made a deal as a family last week that in Outrider we would be proactive rather than reactive and that's what we're doing this week. So how to write a research proposal. Let's do this, come on. So we're gonna talk about how to take charge of a research proposal and how to render it a very successful and useful part of a higher degree program. I know it seems all about compliance and stuff and it often can be, but I wanna tell you why a research proposal exists and how it can be useful Yes, useful, even though it is frightening, useful to you. The first thing I need you to remember is that the PhD research proposal hasn't always existed. In fact, it's a relatively recent intervention in the HDR, high degree space. Uh, in fact, 20 years ago, people were not asked to do a research proposal at all. For example, when I did my PhD, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I'd applied to gain entry into the program, <laughs> there was one part of the form that had two lines, two lines that said, what are you thinking of doing for this PhD? And you wrote two sentences in that space. And no one really read that form and those two sentences were never mentioned again. So if anybody ever says to you, oh, you know, it's all so much easier now. When I was a young scholar, it was so much harder to get in. That's, that's nonsense, that's nonsense. The research proposal is a really, really new intervention in the higher degree space. So don't get that weird sort of nostalgia about hard thing, how hard things were in the dim dark past. That's nonsense. So what makes a lot of the research proposal stuff a bit silly? at the moment, and I'll call it because it is a bit silly, is students are asked to do a research proposal before they've even gained entry into the program. So they're asked when they apply into a program that they present a research proposal. Now, this is weird. It's also a bit silly because so many projects emerge through a really productive and great conversation between supervisors and students before we even get into the experimental fundamental sciences whereby a student applies to join a lab and very frequently is slotted into a particular project that already existed before they applied and they're funded to do that particular slice of a project. So therefore, as you can see, the research proposal coming into a program is completely and absolutely redundant. And we're gonna talk about the specific problems that exist for this research proposal stuff in the theoretical social sciences and the humanities. But as you can see, for the sciences, it's a bit silly. For the humanities and the social sciences, it's a bit silly. So it's a bit silly. But that is one version of the research proposal. It is part of the application process into a doctoral program. Now, the more serious, the more important research proposal is presented as part of the first milestone in most programs around the world. And this is often called a confirmation of candidature. It is at CDU, just so you know. So a confirmation of candidature has a research proposal presented. Now you can see the problem here. Both those things, the one that happens when you just apply and hope you'll get entry into a program and the crucial compliance component as part of a confirmation of candidature, both those documents are called the same thing. And that's, I think, what creates a lot of the confusion and indeed the worry. And I think the other thing that creates all the confusion and the worry is there are literally thousands of templates 
for research proposals that exist all over the world. And the thing that makes it so amusing, I think, is each one of those templates determines and says, this is the definitive template. Don't believe those other templates. We are the template. And the key to remember, I think, is that's not true. There are many ways to do a research proposal. The key variable for you to consider is actually what the research proposal is, is the presentation of your skill sets, okay? It see, it, it's, it's a way to determine, if you will, it's a proxy to determine whether or not you can do a project, that the project is okay and that you are able to do it. So as you can see, the research proposal is actually, at its most basic, a proxy to assess your ability. And there are all sorts of good things that come from that big research proposal. It teaches you all sorts of really significant tasks. So it's a lot easier after you've written that to write a book proposal. It's so much easier to write a grant or funding proposal. So it is a model that travels and can be really useful to you. But always please remember that research proposals exist in their diversity. Yes, there are particular headings that we can talk about, but the research proposal is a genre. It has specific characteristics, but look, it's like disco, right? And disco has particular characteristics, but it's a very, very broad and truly fabulous genre. So the challenge is now, I think, and it's been fascinating doing the research for Fee for this week. I've read 32 books that are all titled something like how to write a research proposal. Now, I could feel sort of my brain dripping out of my ear while I was doing this. Now, what's amazing is of those 32 books, they're all quite different. <laughs> and all of them, again, configure themselves as the definitive guide. <laughs> to writing a research proposal and can I say none of them were great or interesting and they're really boring in fact to be honest with you when I was doing the reading it was like watching a sloth do 10 pin bowling now I love me a sloth but you know it's not the most exciting of things to be watching in real time but you know what today let's get excited <laughs> let's get excited with the sloth <laughs> Bless. Come on, sloth. Let's get excited with the sloth and let's knock down those pins and we can do it in a really straightforward and clear way, okay? So just be aware, this is the caveat I'm offering at this point. There is a research proposal industry out there and all these people are writing all these books to get you a bit anxious, get you a bit worried, a bit frightened. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. What goes in a research proposal? And of course, they're therefore creating their own business to get people a bit agitated. So you keep buying these books. So what I want to do today, very, very simple outrider in many ways, present a series of headings to you, yes, but I want to show you the skills that are embedded within those headings. So let's get the genre in place, if you will. And like the best of disco, once I teach you the genre, you can riff and you can turn table and you can have a blast of a dance and you can do your own thing. Brilliant. So just a reminder, and this is the crucial thing, the research proposal, that phrase, is used to describe both the thing that you do before you enter a program and the crucial thing that you do as part of a milestone or a confirmation of candidature. So the language is the same, but they're actually very different things. To give you the most basic difference, the research proposal that you configure as you enter a program, so please let me into the program, oh supervisor, please let me into the program, that's no more than 2,000 words, so it's very, very short. Now, the research proposal you have to do for the confirmation of candidature, hello, it is much bigger. It can get up to 10,000 words, but seven to 9,000 words, that's the sweet spot. So let's start with those really basic headings that can be used. So that's just calming the farm, get everybody nice and calm. And we're going to start with the really simple one. So the research proposal as part of the application. So if you're frightened, if you're out there and overwhelmed and you're desperate to apply to get into a program and they've asked you to do a research proposal, this is what you do. So here are the headings. Title page. <laughs> Aims and objectives literature review, 
methodology, timelines to completion, required resources, and bibliography. That's it. That's the most common structure. It's the simplest, and noting how small that document is, it's probably the best. It is the entry level protocol, right? And you're trying to convince a supervisor, you're trying to convince a funder often that you are able to do this. Yes, they're sort of assessing a proposal, but they're assessing you more than the project. So the length again is about 2,000 words. So this is about content. But it's not really what we're assessing when I get I get hundreds of those when I get them I'm assessing your meta skills can you write can you read are you able to shape literature can you reference correctly can you write a research question and if I see that we're golden that's it that's all I'm after so part of the research proposal is actually a skill checklist reading writing synthesizing ideas and being able to ask and have strategies to answer questions. Boom, we're there. Also remember that a PhD is about depth. It's not about breadth. That's crucial. So you need to show a little bit of deep diving there that you do know that it's about depth and demonstrate that you can be thorough and that you can be rigorous. It's not about a vibe. I want you to have a clear structure and I want you to put clear ideas under those headings. So remember, this is a research proposal. Think about that phrase. It proposes research. It doesn't do research. It proposes research. So that's it. That's all you need for the 2000 worder coming in to say, please, will you consider me to enter into this program? That's it. Let's now get to the serious one. Okay, this is the, the deal breaker uh, research proposal. This is the compliance research proposal. This is part of a milestone. This is part of a confirmation of candidature. This determines if you are, are allowed to continue and indeed complete this thesis. So this does, does matter. I'm not pretending or minimizing this. We'll talk about what's wrong with it, but this is an important moment. Again, I'm going to present some very clear headings. If you're just going, oh, I'm just going to present some very clear headings for you. Follow them and we're golden. The challenge is, team, that those headings don't work for a lot of disciplines. So it feels like you're putting plasticine through a straw. I understand that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore as many disciplines as possible and show you, even if you're going, what goes under that heading for me, I'll give you something to put under that heading. So the challenge we've got is that there are epistemological, ontological and methodological assumptions that exist in a research proposal. And those assumptions come from the experimental sciences, medical sciences and allied health sciences in particular, with some sweeping applications into the applied social sciences. But for many disciplines, I understand you're looking at this structure and thinking, what is going on? I understand that there are reasons for that, but I can make it work for you as well. And please remember, yes, you're sort of in your, you're a star of your own life. You go, oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Remember the whole point that you're doing this, it ain't about you. You're constructing this research proposal for your assessors. Now, what are the assessors after? Right, they want to see, can you write research questions and do you know how to answer them? Okay. They want to see that you have an understanding of the time involved in completing tasks and the resources and the funding that is required to complete those tasks. They want to see the prior research on the topic. They want to see that you are able to verify and check your outcomes. And most importantly, they're looking for a SOC a significant original contribution to knowledge. So I'm going to talk through the research proposal now. This is the big one. This is the main one that's tethered to the milestone. And we're going to talk particularly about those headings, but also how different disciplines can work with those headings. So let's do this. And let's start with the really obvious stuff. <laughs> the title page. The title page. You need a title 
and a subtitle. The title can be sexy and fabulous. The subtitle must be descriptive and clear. The title certainly can be catchy and it's fantastic if it is catchy and a bit edgy, fantastic. Now on this title page you include your name, really pretty important, student number, the qualifications that you already hold, the qualification for which this research proposal is organised, and then a statement about your faculty, your research centre, your college, your supervisor's names, please spell them correctly, and the date. Okay, winning, page one, done. We can do this, come on. So the second page now features your first heading, and I know this will be a surprise to you. The first heading is introduction. <laughs> The introduction matters a lot. To be frank with you, it's probably the most important bit. And what you need to do in the introduction, the meta skill, is you need to convey energy and excitement with your project. You need to show direction. You need to show momentum. Why are you doing this? And why are you doing it now? Make sure both those questions are answered. So what happens now? is in the introduction in a lot of disciplines there are subheadings in place now we have an introduction and the subheadings in place that's most commonly deployed in the experimental sciences in medicine public health allied health so big introduction and subheadings we will often see in the theoretical social sciences and the humanities, there'll be an introduction, but then the subheadings are not actually subheadings, they're whole headings in and of themselves. So be aware both those systems and structures operate just fine. So let's go through what those headings are, and these are really important. Let's do it nice and carefully. The first one is statement of the problem. Statement of the problem. And what you are doing is you, under this heading, you present the gap in the literature that you are going to resolve, the gap that you are going to fill. Next heading, research questions. Three to five. Three to five. Good, clear questions. They will change. The assessors will help you, but the assessors are assessing if you have any idea what a research question is. So have a good go. Then we move to aims and objectives. This is, if you like, the goal that you have for your research. What are you trying to do? This is the big picture stuff, if you like. What are you trying to achieve and why? And what steps will you implement what strategy will you configure to reach those goals so that's the big picture stuff there then rationale why the research needs to be done right now why wasn't this gap filled five years ago why can't the gap be filled in five years time why now then we move to SOC significant original contribution to knowledge. How will this thesis contribute to your field, your subject, or your discipline? And I would like you to work through all four of those words, significant, original, contribution, knowledge. They're all different. Some research proposals then have two other headings, abstract and keywords. We see that quite often in medicine, nursing, allied health. My argument is you've already presented the abstract and so forth. Why would you need to go again? But anyway, in those particular disciplines, medicine, nursing, allied health, put in an abstract and put in keywords. Right. That's the end of your introduction with its subheadings. So you can see what we've done there. We've now got a pretty small but pretty well presented summary of the project. That's fantastic. That is very hard writing to do and not one word of that is wasted because you're going to be able to scoop all of that up out of your research proposal and slam it straight into the actual introduction of your thesis. No wasted words here. Fabulous. And I know it's tough writing so give yourself credit for doing that tough writing. Okay. Now we move to the literature review. Now we move to the literature review. This is where the problems start because 
The literature review in a research proposal is different from a literature review in a thesis. Again, the same words are used, but they describe very, very different things. And that's why the confusion happens. In the research proposal, this is how you do a, a literature review in the research proposal. First thing you need to do is, who are the big names in this field? Names, names, names. Who are the big names in this field? And how have they worked in and around the gap in the knowledge that I've configured? How have those big names worked with and around my research questions, right? That's crucial. The other thing that we need to see in the research proposal literature review is new names. New, new, new. I need to see the big, sexy, innovative names, people that are working in the last year. So I need to see the year you're doing your research proposal, there needs to be references from that year and the new and emerging scholars and present those really current references in your literature review. So think about it in this way. The point of a literature review in your research proposal is you are trying to provide a frame or a shape that limits or provides the parameters for your data collection and your analysis. So that will help you create timelines and all the rest of it. And also, of course, meta skill again, the literature review shows that you have expertise, you have knowledge in your field but also you cannot prove a significant original contribution to knowledge if you do not understand the knowledge in the field. And for me, they, and I do thousands of these roles as assessors around the world, the deal breaker for me is always when a student is doing that, this is my significant original contribution to knowledge, look at me, this is the gap in the literature, and they've only located a gap in the literature because they haven't read the literature. So they're going, this is a gap, and it's like, well, about 15,000 people have written in that gap, and you haven't referenced any of them. Right, so just make sure you're demonstrating you know the field, you've got it going on, and therefore the gap is a real gap and not a gap caused because you haven't read enough. Right, the challenge therefore is how you shrink this literature review into a proposal. Okay, and I know, and I'll just do the, the caveat line here again, I know for a lot of our colleagues in the humanities and the theoretical social sciences, you're going, what is going on here? Because we tend to use what are called integrated literature reviews. We don't have a literature review chapter in a thesis. We have each section have a section in each chapter that is a literature review, and that's called an integrated literature review. So the idea that you're sort of slamming this all together is like, why am I doing this? And I get that. And what I think we've got to try and do, think about it this way. This is a different thing. You are configuring a bonsai literature review for your research proposal. Make sure the big names are there. Make sure that there's some recent names there. And what I need you to do then is pick out between three to five themes or research clusters. So you're not just going, doing one damn name after another in a literature review, you are clustering the concepts to demonstrate there is a gap in the field. And again, give it a subheading to help yourself. These are the research clusters that I'm focusing on. The other great hint I would give you about the literature review and about the research proposal most generally is be as clear as you can, get this sentence right. What is the gap in knowledge? What is the gap in knowledge and how is your thesis going to fill that gap? You're organising your literature review to locate the gap. And then the PhD research fills the gap. So in many ways, what a PhD is about is finding a gap and filling it. Pretty easy definition that and you're proving how that'll work in the proposal. We now move to methodology and things get even weirder in methodology. Weird, 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 weird times. Methodology explores why you are selecting particular methods. Why you are selecting particular methods and why those methods will allow you to find and organize and analyze data sets. Right, now when you gather data sets, before you start, you need to have a frame in place. You need to have a parameter in place whereby this is, the, this is the data set that I'm gathering and this is when I stop. 
So you are collecting data in an already existing frame and framework. The assumption too often is that every scholar in a PhD program is finding new data. So I'm what I'm the new data sets, I'm going to do interviews, I'm surveys, blah, blah, blah. so this is the notion that every thesis is an empirical thesis. Nay empiricist. Let's be kind. That every thesis is an empirical thesis. That is simply not true. That's not the case. There are so many disciplines where non-reactive data sets, data sets that already exist, are being used, whether it's in social media, whether it's in census data sets, so many thousands, newspapers, magazines, archives, etc., popular culture. But think about how rarely unobtrusive research methods are taught. Have you even ever heard of the phrase unobtrusive research methods? And you're in a PhD program. So unobtrusive research methods are fantastic and important, and yet they are rarely taught. Don't assume that all research projects generate data, because they don't. Great research projects, tremendous, triumphant research projects, simply re-engage with old data sets and create remarkable analytical protocols to engage with them. The challenge I have is the proposals endlessly focus on methodology, like the biggest chunk of it is methodology. And there's not too much on theory, with or without a capital T. Indeed, theory is often, oh dear, the first subheading of the methodology section. And that's how people do it, so I disagree with it, but so there we go. So methodology, theory is the first heading. Under this heading, be clear, be really clear. What is your theoretical approach? Name it. What is your theoretical approach? And then, who are the theorists that influence you? And name them. Cite them. There are many definitions of theory that hook into epistemology or ontology or axiology. And therefore, for a lot of research proposals, all the attention on methodology, all the attention on methodology means that the theory is seriously undercooked. And that's the start of so many problems that we see in doctoral programs, I would argue. And particularly, I would argue, in the experimental sciences, the applied social sciences, methodology is the key heading, theory is neglected, and that tends to warp the entire project. For example, say we're researching indigenous taxonomy, we're investigating philosophy of science, we're investigating science education. Now in those particular conversations, ontology and axiology are absolutely foundational. The deal breaker conversations before we even ever think about methodology. The key with methodology is to explain the most common methods used in your discipline, why that is the case, and why you are using those methods or you decide not to. Please talk about research design. A good conversation about research design is able to align theory and methodology and demonstrates how the research tasks can be completed on time. It also shows that the methods that you have selected will enable you to answer your research question. So don't get lost in the methodology section. For all my wonderful nursing colleagues out there, hello, I love all my nurses, I hope you are fantastic. I think this is a real problem in nursing at the moment, that methodology is just taking over the entire research proposal. Please focus on the methodology and the methods you require to answer the research questions. That's it. That's it. And please remember all the way through the methodology section, talk about ethics and talk about ethics clearances. Now, again, in a lot of disciplines, an ethics clearance is not required. But that doesn't mean that you don't talk about ethics. You just talk about ethics in a different way. What are the ethical considerations that you come to when you make these decisions? Right, we're doing well. The next big heading is resources. Now, I know this seems very dull, 
but resources are absolutely crucial and they can end your program. If you require equipment, if you require travel funding, say for field work, and your university or your school or your lab does not have that money, then your project stops right here. Be really clear about, therefore, what is urgent and what are necessary resources. Don't do a shopping list. Oh, I'd really like this. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can go to office work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stationery. Uh, no. Uh, just uh, one of my former jobs was as a head of school, and I would get the first look at these research proposals and I always remember it was section nine. Section nine were the resources. So I had a look, but my job was to assess if we had the resources. And if the student put in their shopping list and I didn't have the resources, the head of school did not sign that proposal off and the thesis stopped until the budget was changed. So please do not for one moment think that the resourcing section is just sort of a shopping list or it doesn't matter. It can be the end of your project. And then we move to the, the next heading. We're nearly finished. Then we move to the next heading, timetable. Again, a deal breaker. For me, this is how I know if somebody knows what they're doing. Again, proxy. See, it's a proxy for your ability. For me, this is crucial. Does the student know how to align task and time orientation so they can complete in three years? And by that, I mean, are they clear about the tasks that they need to do, and that's important, but are they then able to accurately assign a timeline to those tasks? As I always say, and you always repeat back to me, which is lovely, this is not your life's work. A PhD is not your life's work. It's not the best research you'll ever do. It is the worst research you will ever do. Yes, you can use a Gantt chart, love me a good Gantt chart, that's fine. Be clear about the stages and the tasks that you're going to complete and attach real timelines to them and you will be held accountable to and for those timelines. The next section yay, is your conclusion. Use that heading. This matters too. In the conclusion, you talk about why your research matters, mattering, why your research matters and why it matters now and why, this is the good bit, why you are the person, the one person on planet Earth, the one person on planet Earth to do this project now. Basically, I want you to answer one question for me in your conclusion. Why should I care about your thesis? Why should I care about your thesis? Why does it matter? And then, of course, the final heading, here we go. Yeah, is bibliography. Not references, bibliography. I'll explain the difference. References are that which you cite in the previous document. So, you know, your little bracket, Harvard, you cited that. That's a reference list. A bibliography is big. It's everything you've read and will read for the project. This is crucial. I read bibliographies first. I know if the person is knowing, knowing what they're doing by reading the bibliography. The, you know, I read, when I read theses, when I examine theses, I start the bibliography and I know if the student will pass or fail via the bibliography. That's how important it is. We need in the bibliography, we need it to be large. Large. I need to see all the big names, names, names. I need to see the big researchers in the field there. I need to see the new edgy new names. I need the names to be international. Don't just think, with the greatest respect to my colleagues in North America and Europe, please do not think that the best scholars in the world are in North America and Europe. They are not. Think about international knowledge. Also think about interesting multimodal sources. I love it when students find all sorts of interesting YouTube materials. They find podcasts. They find interesting lectures. They find other people's PhDs. So lots of multimodal material really gets me excited. Yeah. Most examiners will read your thesis from the back. Most assessors read your proposal from the back. Make it strong. It matters. And please remember, ref reference correctly and consistently, we're assessing your meta skills like information literacy. And the final just few formatting things to make sure everything's in place, please number the pages, consistent fonts, 
no spelling or grammatical errors particularly of your supervisor's name that does undermine your credibility somewhat and please use those nice clear headings these formatting issues are not there for you they're present for your assessor so that they are able to guide themselves orient themselves through your research it also can i say does help you because those headings simplify then the presentation that you will present on that proposal it gives you a nice guide to speak to as you can see the research proposal is not actually difficult it's simply a genre of writing that we do rarely in our professional lives it's a learning tool it's also a teaching tool and please remember it is a genre of professional communication prof com it confirms that you have a plan before you build a thesis it is persuasive writing but you also demonstrate your competence yes the competence of the project but your competence is being assessed so keep your eyes on the meta question all the time what are you planning to do why do you want to do it how do you want to do it when do you want to do it boof 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 so you're writing this proposal not for yourself not for your supervisors you're writing it for your assessors so help them help them know what they're going to need to know about your topic that they know what they need to know about you to assess you and your ability to do this and the proposal too must be exciting i know sloth the proposal must be exciting your energy why you want to do this you can be doing all sorts of other fabulous things why are you here now why are you excited make sure your conclusion conveys that so as you can see what all of this about is about is being clear that you matter and your research matters and so the research proposal configures and shapes and presents those mattering maps that's it thank you wonderful queen fee for the suggestion and i wish you love light and peace tea out